Chapter Twenty One of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter Twenty One. Fancy, like the finger of a clock, runs the great circuit and is still at home. Cowper. The uproar of rushing waters was still in my ears but I was in my chair before the hearth in the living room of the farmhouse, and the noise was the din of a tempest outside. Opposite me, Phillida and Desire were clinging together, watching me with such looks of gladness and anxiety that I felt myself abashed before them. Bagheera, the cat, sat on the table beside the lamp, yellow eyes blinking at each flash and rattle of lightning and thunder, while he sleeked his recently wetted fur. Wondering where that wet had come from, I discovered presently that the fire was out, and the hearth drenched with soot-stained water. I looked toward the windows from which the curtains had been drawn aside. Rain poured glistening down the panes, but the clean storm was empty of horror. "'Drink some of this, Mr. Locke,' urged Vere whose arm was about me. "'Sit quiet, and I guess you'll be all right in a few moments.' I took the advice. Strength was flowing into me, as inexplicably as it had flowed away from me a while past. How can I describe the certainty of life that possessed me? The assurance was established, singularly enough, for all of us. None of my companions asked, and I myself never doubted whether the danger might return. The experience was complete and closed. Moreover, already the thing that had been our enemy, the horror that had been its atmosphere, the mystery that haunted desire, all were fading into the past. The phantoms were exorcised and the house purified of fear. But there was something different from ordinary storm in this tempest. The tumult of rain and wind linked another, deeper roar within theirs. The house quivered with a steady trembling, like a bridge over which a train is passing. Pulling myself together, I turned to Veer. "'What is happening outdoors?' I asked. "'The cloudburst was too much for the dam,' he answered regretfully. It went off with a noise like a big gun a while back. I expect the lake is flooding the whole place and messing up everything from our cellar to the chicken house. Daylight is due pretty soon now, and the storm is dying down. We'll be able to add up the damage after a bit. The water came down the chimney and drowned Bagheera, Phillida had bravely tried to summon nonchalance. Isn't it lucky you and Desire could not get started in the car after all? Fancy being out in that. Desire Mitchell steadied her soft lips and gave her quota to the shelter of commonplace speech we raised between ourselves and emotions too recently felt. It was like the tropical storms in Papua, where I lived until this year, she said. Once, one blew down the mission house. Veer's weather prediction proved quite right. In an hour, the storm had exhausted itself, or passed away to other places. Sunrise came with a veritable glory of crimson and gold, blazing through air washed limpidly pure by the rain. The east held a troop of small clouds, red as flamingos, flying against a shining sky. Last traces of our tempest. We stood on the porch together to survey an unfamiliar scene in the rosy light. Water overlay lawns and paths, so the house stood in a wide, shallow lake whose ripples lapped around the white cement steps and the pillars of the porte cochere. Phillida's Pekin ducks floated and fed on this new waterway as contentedly as upon their accustomed pastures. Small objects sailed on the flood here and there, Bagheera's milk pan from the rear veranda bobbed amidst a fleet of apples shaken down in the orchard, while some wooden garden tools nudged a silk canoe cushion. 
In contrast to all this aquatic prospect, where the real lake had been, there now lay some acres of ugly, oozing marsh, its expanse dotted with the bodies of dead water creatures and such of Veer's young trout as had not been swept away by the outpouring flood. The dam was a mere pile of debris through which trickled a stream bearing no resemblance to the sparkling waterfall of yesterday. Already the sun's rays were drawing a rank, unwholesome vapor from the long submerged surface. We contemplated the ruin for a while, without words. "'Poor drawls!' Phillida sighed at length. "'All your work just rubbed out.' "'Never mind, Veer,' I exclaimed impulsively. "'We will put it all back in the same shape as it was.' But even as I spoke, I felt an odd shock of uneasiness and recoil from my own proposition. I did not want the lake to be there again, or to hear the unaccountable sounds to which it gave birth and the varying fall of the cataract over the dam. Did the others share my repugnance? I seemed to divine that they did. Even the impetuous Phil did not break out in welcome of my offer. Desire, who had smoothed her sober gray dress in some feminine fashion, and stood like Marguerite or Melisande with a great braid over either shoulder, moved as if to speak, then changed her intention. A faint distress troubled her expression. As usual, Veer himself quietly lifted us out of unrest. "'I'm not sure that couldn't be bettered, Mr. Locke,' he demurred. That is, if you liked, of course. That marsh could be cleaned up and drained into pretty rich land, I guess. And down there beyond the barn, on the other side where the creek naturally widens out into a kind of basin, I should think might be the spot for a smaller, cleaner lake. Does it seem to you, Ethan, I said, that we have progressed rather past the Mr. Locke stage? A little later, when Desire and I were alone on the porch, we walked to the end nearest the vanished lake. Or, rather, I led her to a swinging couch there and sat down beside her. "'Point out the path down the hill by which you used to come,' I asked of her. She shook her head. There are no words to paint how she looked in the clear morning, except that she seemed its sister." "'It is only the end of a path that matters,' she said. "'Look instead at the marsh. "'Do you see nothing there stranger than a path through the woods, "'even when trodden by a willful woman?' "'Following her lifted finger, "'I saw a series of long mounds out there in the muddy floor "'not far from the dam. "'Not high, two or three feet at most. "'The mounds formed an irregular square of considerable area.' "'The old house!' I exclaimed. "'It was set on fire by the second Desire Mitchell one night deep in winter. "'Her father built this house of yours "'and put in the dam that covered the ruins with water. "'I think he hoped to wash away the horror upon the place. "'I know so little of your history. "'You can imagine it,' she turned her head from me. The first child came back from England when it was a man grown, and claimed the house and name of the first desire. He settled and married here. For two generations, only sons were born to the Mitchells. I do not know if the dark one came to them. I believe it did, but they were hard, austere men who beat off evil. Then a daughter was born. She looked like the first desire, and she was not good. She was a scandal to the family. She listened to it. The tradition is that she set fire to the house after a terrible quarrel with her people, but herself perished by some miscalculation. There were no more girls born for another while after that, not until my father's time. He had a sister who resembled the two desires of the past. My grandfather brought her up in harshness and austerity, holding always before her 
the wickedness to which she was born. Yet it was no use. She fled from his house with a man no one knew, and died in Paris after a life of great splendor and heartlessness. Everyone who loved the desires suffered. That is why I covered myself from you. I took her hand, so small a thing to hold and feel flutter in mine. But what of me, desire? The darkness covered no beauty in me, but a defect. You never saw me until last night and now in the morning. Now that you know, you can bear with a man who limps? You so perfect? She turned toward me. Her coal dark eyes, vivid as a summer noon, opened to my anxious scrutiny. But I have seen you often, she said, the heat of confession bright on cheek and lip. I never meant you to know, but now, after the first time you spoke to me so kindly and gaily, I was so very sorrowfully alone, and the convent was so dull. My father's field glasses were in my trunk. Desire? I fear I have no vocation for a nun. I... There is a huge rock halfway down the hill with a clear view of this place. I have spent hours there, watching these lawns and verandas, and the things you all did. It all seemed so amusing and... and happy. You see, where I lived there were almost no white people except my father and a priest at the Catholic mission. So I learned to know Phillida and Mr. Vere and... Then all this time, desire? The glasses brought you very close she whispered. I knew you by night and by day. End of chapter 21 Recording by Roger Moline